Hi, hello, and how the heck are you? That's right. That sexy Rockwell timepiece says it's time. And I know this show right here is going to be an automatic classic. So come on in. Stay a while. It's time to get coached up with another edition of the Coach Scott Field Show. I'm a proud ambassador, brand ambassador of Rockwell Time. So if you go to Rockwell Time, dot com and you use the code coach 20 you'll receive 20 percent off of any merchandise there they have outstanding watches they've got great looking shirts uh sunglasses you name it they've uh they've got some quality gear there like and follow the coach scott field show on our facebook page also don't forget to subscribe to this youtube channel and uh, make sure you hit that bell to receive notifications when our quality content comes on if you're listening to us in podcast form my man jason and i say turn that knob up we're about to put that flavor in your ear and it's going to have all kind of sports sauce on it watch us on db tv monday through fridays and also saturday afternoons where i'm thrilled to say we've been seen in over 300 million households around the globe and thank you to our loyal 400,000 viewers daily also watch us on cstv on wednesdays and also check us out on the rewind sports 60. no matter how you consume us i am grateful grateful, honored, and humbled that you uh, take the time to watch the Coach Scott Field Show. Today, I am super excited to have this gentleman come on with us today. This is unique. This is a little bit different, and I'm thrilled for that. I have Jason Maravich, and you're going to recognize that last name. His father, I have a list of honors and accolades from his dad, Pistol Pete Maravich, three-time All-American, two-time college player of the year, five-time NBA All-Star, 1977 NBA scoring champ. His number 23 was retired at LSU. His number 44 was retired at Atlanta. Number seven was retired right here in my hometown, Salt Lake City with the Jazz. Um, he was also inducted into the Hall of Fame that we're going to get into. But Jason, Thank you so much for your time to come on to the show and share these stories and memories that you have of the iconic legend, Pistol Pete Maravich. Oh, thank you for having me on, man. I think this is going to be a good time. And uh, it, for me, I think just to have your observations and to have your experiences and share what it was like just within the home of that legend, I think goes a long way and it's gonna educate our, uh, our our viewers and listeners. Um, let, let's talk about that. You were at a very young age when your father passed. He was only 40 years old and we'll get into that, but I think you were only eight years old. But what are some of your fondest memories of your father? Uh, the most, Probably the, the most, the biggest one is when we went to Seattle and um, the All-Star game in 1987. Uh, that was the weekend at halftime of the All-Star game. He got inducted into the Hall of Fame. Uh, so it was just me and him. My younger brother was too young to travel at the time. So uh, I remember going in the locker room before the dunk contest, meeting Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, all those guys. And that was probably the first weekend where I really it hit me who my dad really was. I never... Um, I knew he had played basketball. I didn't know how great he was. I really didn't have a clue until I was around all these guys and they were telling me how good he was and all that. So that was an eye-opening experience and probably the thing I remember the most because he passed away, I want to say, eight months after that. Yeah. So, so that must have that must have been about the time that your grandfather Press had passed away. Yes. Yeah. He went, my Press passed away about nine months before my dad did. So right. Uh, right. It was very quick. Um, but uh, I was there at the, uh, his Hall of Fame class, I think, was Rick Barry, yep. Walt Frazier, and a couple, uh, two other guys. Um, but that was a special weekend. Um, I still have a lot of good memories from that. And that was probably the, the the first time I actually knew who, you know, I looked at him, you know, as Pistol Pete as opposed to just dad. So, Oh, wow. Can, can you remember some of the conversations? Like, you know, who, who came up to your dad or who pulled you aside and said, Jason, let me tell you, your dad was the real deal because to me, he was such a, a showman and, a, and such ball mastery, his, his spatial awareness. And he was doing things before, you know, it was, it was 
excitable. I mean, you know, it, coaches back then were old school. It had to be fundamental. So what were some of the comments and what were some of those players that came up to you and made specific comments, if you can remember? Uh, Magic. Magic was a huge fan. He said he was the – my dad was the original Showtime. Uh, Isaiah Thomas was a, a huge fan. Bill Walton absolutely gushed over him. Wow. Uh, yeah, a lot of guys were extremely complimentary. Uh, Bob McAdoo said he was just a basketball genius. They, uh, everybody was so complimentary. It was, uh, I mean, at the time, I, I didn't know how to take it. I was only eight years old, but yeah, uh, I remember running into these guys again in 97 at the 50 greatest players in Cleveland. Um, and that's when I, I heard a lot of stories from these guys and, uh, everyone from bird to McHale to uh, magic, the Jordan, uh, it was that the Cleveland weekend was probably the most, probably the best weekend of my life because everybody was the retired players. And then the current ones were all in one place. Yeah. So I remember being in the hallway uh, of the, all-star game right before we walked out because the 50 greatest players uh my dad was the only one deceased at the time that's right so me and my brother were there to represent him and uh, i remember being in the hallway and michael jordan comes in sweating from the all-star game throws his jacket on and me and my brother just sitting against the wall like in shell shock right so uh magic came up to us and and, and bird and bird said our uh dad would have been very proud of us and charles barkley was actually a huge fan which i didn't know um uh, and actually a funny story when I was a kid, we, there was only like one game on a week. I think it was on TBS. And uh, I always was begging my dad to watch it because he had kind of like gone away from basketball at that point after he got saved. And he, uh, so he would watch basketball with me and the Sixers were on TV a lot, but my dad loved the way Charles Barkley played with his passion and love for the game. And he was a character too. So I think my dad really enjoyed that aspect of it. So uh, I would say those I know I kind of got off tangent there, but the Cleveland thing wow. is kind of mirrors the Seattle thing for me where I ran into a lot of these guys and they told me stories that I'd never heard before. So I love that. Can, share some of those stories before we get into the top 50. I mean, you know, you mentioned, you know, a few of the names, but do you remember any of the conversations that I know you were only eight years old, but what were the conversations that people were coming up telling your dad or just telling you that may kind of, you know, stick out to you? Uh, Isaiah Thomas said, uh, my dad was the greatest ball handler he'd ever seen. Uh, Dr. J said he was the uh, most skilled basketball player he'd ever seen. And, uh, Elgin Baylor, who was one of my favorite people I met. I'm, I'm glad I got to meet him before he passed. He, I think he had the best compliment I've ever heard about my dad. He said, uh, Jerry West was the best player he ever played with. He said, Oscar Robertson was the best player he ever played against. And he said, my dad was the best player he ever saw, period. Wow. So, yeah. So that, that is was, uh, high praise. Yeah, high right? praise. Yeah. yeah. I mean, trying my Jerry West and Oscar Robertson, two legends. So <laughs> I mean, uh, that's the NBA logo right there. Too. Yeah. <laughs> Talking yeah. about your dad. <laughs> right. So hearing all this stuff is just, it's it makes me unbelievably proud. Um, you know, it's it takes me back when I hear stuff like this. Uh, I, I had a couple of conversations with Will because Wilt was still around at the time and uh, he was a great storyteller. And he told me a, a story about when uh, my dad was with the Hawks and they were playing in LA and my dad went down the lane and tried to sh shoot a scoop shot and Wilt blocked it into like the fifth row. And Wilt told him something, which I can't repeat here. And my dad said, uh, that's okay. I got something for you next time. And then he comes back the same time. This time my dad put up one of those shots where the shot went over the, not over the backboard, but above it. And it just it went right over Chamberlain's hand and went straight in the basket. And my dad said something to block that, you know what? So <laughs> yeah. I, I, I uh, those little stories like that are the stuff I, I really enjoy hearing. So especially yeah. when it's coming from guys like that. I mean, I I was too young to see like Will Chamberlain, Elgin Baylor play, but they're they're you know they're legends in the game. And uh, to hear them talk so highly about my dad was really uh, humbling. Yes, yes. Those are great stories. And I'm thinking back to the story you just shared with me. I'm such a huge historian of the game. So mm -hmm. I do my due diligence and I do my research. And I love to throw out names that, you know, change the game or transform the game or took it to another level. And I truly believe not just because you're on this show, but I truly believe your father was one of those guys 
who did that. He was a trendsetter, um, known for the, you know, the floppy socks, the flowing hair, but just the way, you know, he would come up and, and run that break and his ability to score is, is legendary. Cause I mean, you, you talk about a guy in college, I mean, he scores, what is it? 3,667 points before the shot clock era, before the three point line. Right. What type of stories do you hear about his college days or have you ever just taken the time and been like, you know, what was dad like and go back and watch YouTube videos? What types of things do you recollect or do you enjoy seeing about those LSU days playing for your grandfather? The, the college days, I've seen a lot of a lot of tape on that. And uh, he honestly looks like somebody that was transplanted from 50 years in the future. He was he was at such a different speed and, and skill level at that time. I, I think I think you can make the argument he's probably the most out of any athlete I've ever seen. I think he was ahead of his time more than more so than any athlete I've ever seen. Um, I, I think you could put him in today's game. I think he'd be even better. Oh, because a lot of people didn't realize he was a six five point guard. That's right, which, which was big back then, but that'd, that'd be big now. That's right. So, That's and right. His skill level was off the charts. And then like he never had a three point line uh, before he had the knee injury with New Orleans. He was uh, he was he had a lot of speed, a lot of quickness, but he his skill level was just so off the charts. It was uh, watching some of the stuff at LSU. It was. I mean, it's just video game numbers like to think that you can score 40 and it's going to hurt your average to me is just. You know, if a guy scores 45 in a game in college today at Leeds Sports Center, it's the, it's the number one. But to say that he averaged that was uh, – but I, I got uh, – another one of the biggest compliments I ever got from him was uh, I got to meet John Wooden before he died. Wow. He was 99 at the time, and he was still really sharp. And him and Press uh, actually used to do camps together at Campbell College. Yep. And uh, they used to do clinics, and my dad would demonstrate the drills. And – uh Wooden always told press that he was absolutely amazed at my dad's skill level. He said it was just, he had never seen anything like it. And uh, so the, I've talked to a lot of guys that played against him in college and that played with him, like his ex teammates. And they said a lot of times during the game, they would get caught just watching him instead of actually playing. <laughs> like he was just so, uh, so unbelievable. I mean, yes. he, I wish, I wish this generation could have seen him play because I th I think he would have been if he was playing today. I think he'd be the most popular player in the league. I really do. Uh, you, you know, Jason, I I agree with you, and and I'm even going to expand and elaborate. You know, that three thousand six hundred sixty-seven points is in only three seasons. So yes, to average forty-four points a game to me that'll never be touched. Uh, just again his foresight, his progressive thinking, his ability to see the game one or two steps ahead of everybody else. You said, you know, it's like video game, but to me, that's cheat code video game. Yeah, this, yeah. this guy, when I watch video of him, and I even mentioned to you a couple of days ago, just in our interaction, I had coach Russ Bergman come on and he was a teammate of your father's at LSU. And he too was in awe, you know, he talked about, you know, stories, you know, back at the hotel rooms and going off to eat. And he kind of liked to be by himself and, you know, the pressures that were, you know, put upon him or on himself that, you know, he kind of liked to isolate himself, but just to be around his energy and his aura and his presence where people are busting out windows and climbing up to crawl in just so they could see and, right. and, and watch the legend to me that's phenomenal stuff and and hopefully that fills you and your family with a sense of pride to hear these iconic people not just say things because of their words but they're saying those things and sharing those things with you because it truly moved a generation and his legend continues to live you know his legacy continues to live and that's why i'm so honored to have you on this show to sh i can share my sentiments and, and give flowers to your family for how he's touched so many lives yeah i, I i'm still in you know i he, he he the last game he played in was almost 45 years ago right and his name his name is still really relevant today it's just a testament to him and how crazy good he was uh i i I've been watching basketball probably since 1986, like consistently. I, I, I'm i more an old school fan. I, I, I grew up watching 80s and 90s, so that's my uh, 
that's my time period I like to watch. But uh, I've never seen anybody like him to this day. Um, that's right. Some people have like bits and pieces, but I've never seen the whole package with him. Like I, his passing ability was 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 unbelievable. Like that's the one thing I see missing in today's game. You don't really have a lot of flashy, really good passers. Um, you got the guys that can handle or shoot, but the passing is like a, a lost art to me. I don't. Yeah. I don't really see a lot of great passers in today's game. So, I mean, yeah. you can argue the best passer in today's game is actually uh, Jokic. Great point. So. And, and and at his size and his positions, uh, to me, I, I hate to compare players, but yeah. I, I think a comparison that you can make, Jokic is what so you know Arvita Sabonis would have been yes. had he come to the league earlier. But yet, I watch you know I watch your dad. And just the creativity and the looseness. I mean, maybe a Jason Williams had yes. a little bit of that sauce to his he game. Did. But yeah, yeah. But so he, but, that, but, I was talking. I was I was talking to a friend of mine about this the other day. Jason Williams only played like that for his first season or two, and then he dialed it back big time, which I never understood. Like his his rookie year, he was very fun to watch. He he had a lot of stuff that reminded me of my dad, and yeah. uh, for some reason he got. Uh, he, I don't know if the coaches didn't like him playing like that, or, but he he changed his whole game after his first year or two, which I was kind of disappointed because he he brought a lot of style back to the game. And, That's uh, right. I think you know the NBA is entertainment, and my dad used to always say that you have to you have to do something more to bring fans back than just put the ball in the hoop. You have to you know keep them coming back. But and my dad understood that I think as well as anybody that ever played. Like he was he always wanted to win first, but he also wanted to put on a show for the fans because he understood it was about the fans, which it really is. So, uh, you know, it, it's sports entertainment. Your yes. dad, your dad was so skilled at the sport. He yes. could provide the showmanship and the entertainment on top. Cause to me, it was almost like a basketball savant. He would get bored with just the mundane fundamentals that he had to do something to entertain himself, to keep yes. his mind sharp. Now, maybe yeah, I'm was- wrong, but that's what I see when I watch him. Oh, that, well, that's he, you know, during the summers, he would spend 10 hours in the gym. So he he, he started coming up with stuff because he would get bored. And I remember uh, <laughs> the late uh, actor uh, Walter Matthau used to go to jazz games back in the day. And he uh, he said it was funny. He goes, if you missed a game, you know, you would call your buddy and no one would ever ask if the jazz won or lost. It was just how many points did Pistol get? That's what, <laughs> that's what, that's what everybody wanted to know. So um, he just was so unique and so out of his time and I, I i wish i've told my buddies this i wish i could go back in time to an lsu game or a jazz game just to watch him play live because everyone that's ever come up to me and has shared a story the, the look on their face it's like one of the greatest moments they they, they remember it they loved it they cherished it uh, so he brought a lot of joy to people's lives uh and i for i, I know i might be a little biased but uh, if I had to pay to watch one player in the history of the game, I'm, I'm going to see him. So. Uh, Jason, I love that. And call it biased if you want. I call right. that honest and authentic because it's yeah. true. The wonderment that he left people, you know, a lot of people can say certain things, but it's how your dad made people feel when they watch the game. It's like watching Pele for the first time doing a bicycle kick to score a goal. Your dad was that guy. He was him. Right. And so so to me, we, we can sit here and talk about this. And I implore people to go on YouTube and, and do their research, especially this younger generation who's never been exposed or know of the name or the legend. Go watch these Pistol Pete Maravich plays because think about him coming down full speed on the fast break, faking the behind the back pass, cupping it, and then coming back and, and completing a play. Right. Those things were, again, two and three steps beyond even what you see today. I, and again, we could go on and on with those stories, but I truly believe that those kinds of things is what helped elevate the game because they're like, dang, this white boy is serving us up. And that was also an issue because here he come into the league, you know, making a, you know, a, a substantial contract when you had veterans. And I'm sure there was distension there and a little bit of what we would call hate today. But uh, man, the things that your dad was able to do because of the hours that he spent, like you said, 10 hours a day, you know, going through drills and perfecting his feel and his touch and, you know, entertaining himself. 
is, is beyond legend. Yeah, they uh, he uh, out of college, he had three offers. He had uh, the Atlanta Hawks offer. He had an offer from the Carolina Cougars in the ABA for $5 million. And then uh, he was the first professional athlete to sign a million-dollar contract. And he actually had an offer. He was the first white guy ever invited to be a Harlem Globetrotter. That's right. So, That's uh, right. And he, um, Jerry Colangelo once said when uh, Steve Nash was with, with Phoenix and they were doing the seven seconds or less off offense, uh, Jerry Colangelo was asked, if you could have one player in the history of the game to run this offense, who would you want? And before he even finished the question, he goes, Pistol Pete. Ooh. He said, he said in an offense like this, he would be absolutely phenomenal. Um, so I, I thought that was pretty cool. And uh, yeah, he, uh, he did get resentment with Atlanta. He was, you know, one of the few white guys on a predominantly black team and yeah. he came in making more money than anybody. So there was some resentment there. And uh, I know a lot of the Hawks players like Lou Hudson in particular had said their problem wasn't so much with my dad, but with management. Um, and it, it it was an uncomfortable situation for a while there, but uh, you know, when he got traded to new Orleans, he kind of got like a second chance, felt refreshed, could start, he, he was back home. And so he really flourished there. And uh, the funny thing is he tore his knee up in 77. I think it was trying to throw a, a between the legs pass from the other free throw line. <laughs> and uh, the next year, the next year he led the league in scoring at 31 a game with a a 10 pound knee brace on his knee. So that's right. And so, and, and matter of fact, that's the year he had 68 versus the yeah. New York Knicks. Have right. you ever seen footage of that game? Oh, I've got it on DVD. It's called the, uh, the night of pistol Pete. It's uh, I actually talked to Walt Frazier and Roman Rowe about that. And uh, the funny thing was Roman Rowe, great, great player, great person too. He told me that the Pearl. Uh, yes. Earl the Pearl, another underrated legend. He, uh, he told me that, um, I think in the first quarter, I think, or maybe second quarter, my dad had hit like 15 points or 20 points straight. And uh, Red Holzman called a timeout. And, uh, you know, they go to the bench and Walt Frazier looked at Monroe and he said, do you want to take him? And Monroe said, no, you're the, you're the defensive specialist. You stay with him. Like, I don't know. <laughs> so uh, that was, I mean, you know, I, uh, Monroe had told me, he said, it doesn't matter who was guarding him that night. He, he was, anything he threw up was going in. So. Uh, so it, now think about that. Let's 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 go back in time, like you said in that time machine, where you had two of the best nicknames battling out: the Pearl and the Pistol. Mm -hmm. And yet your dad dropped sixty-eight in the hallowed gardens. <laughs> Come on, man! That I mean, does it get any better than that? I mean, that storybook legend stuff that you well, think that, you would create in a movie that needs to be a movie. <laughs> well, that game was that game was actually in the Superdome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They uh. I think he, uh, they said with a three point line, he would have had, I think, 83 points. Oh my gosh. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's the crazy part is that there was a lot of shots in that game that were beyond three point range. Right. So, oh man. man. Amazing, yeah. amazing stuff. Uh, and I keep looking at these honors and I'm looking at all these recognitions and, and I'm glad you brought up, you know, his time with with the New Orleans Jazz that came up to Utah Jazz, and of course, then then he gets traded to the Boston Celtics, and uh, you know, playing along with Larry Bird and that group. Do do you remember any stories about? You know, I know how how much praise Larry Bird had for him uh, right. and his skill set and abilities, and uh, you know, able to pass. But what what do you remember about the Celtic days? Because again, you were very young. But do you ever remember him coming home, talking about practices, or being around that group of of Celtics where it was his closest chance to winning a championship before you know he retired? I don't. I, don't, I, was, I was a year old when he retired, so yeah. I, I don't. I, the the Boston stuff, I really don't know much about. Like I know. I know he wished he could have gotten there sooner in his career because uh, he said ball. He always said Boston's culture was the best he had ever seen. Wow. Uh, it was, it was a great, it was all built around team team first and uh, they were well coached and he, he loved playing in that system. The problem was, I think he was only there for six months and he retired because of hit both his knees were shot. Right. Even though he right. was only 32, but uh, the sad part is, you know, he retired and they, the Celtics won the championship the next year. Yeah, that, and, that's how close he was to that ring, right? And he was holding on just for to try to get that ring. Um, yeah. Because I think if, if he wouldn't have been with Boston, I think he would have – I don't even think he would have played another six months because I think he was just in, in pain with his knees. And uh, nice. he was holding on to try to get that ring. But, unfortunately, the timing was just really off. 
Yeah. Now he didn't get a championship ring, but he got the Naismith Memorial Hall of Fame ring. Right. So, and one of the youngest players to ever be inducted into the Hall of Fame. He still might be. I don't. I'm not sure. I don't. Yeah. I know he was for a while. I don't know if he still is, but he was the youngest ever inducted for a while. It is. I mean, what kind of stories did you get to hear from, like the Hall of Fame uh, induction? Because again, that's that. What is that? Eighty-seven or so. But right. I mean, think about the legends and and again the guys that he was inducted with. Rick Barry, who is synonymous with scoring ABA and NBA, he's been a guest on this show. Uh, you know, you mentioned Walt Frazier, who's mm -hmm. still in broadcasting. But did you get to hear stories of people? talk about him with the induction yeah i did um I'm, you know it's a little hazy i was i remember uh i think i talked to wes unseld uh i'm trying to think who else was there elvin hayes wow. um there was a couple other guys but the 87 thing i i more so remember meeting the guys that i was watching on tv at the time yeah so you know meeting magic meeting jordan I mean, I, I was wearing Jordan shoes when we went in the locker room. So <laughs> I was looking at Michael Jordan like the way kids looked at my dad when they were growing up. That, so, that's, uh, you know, when, when I walk in the locker room and my dad and Jordan shake hands and start talking, I'm thinking, my dad knows Michael Jordan. Like, <laughs> I thought that I thought that was the coolest thing ever. So, oh, that's cool. I I want to go back to the story, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Coach Scott Field Show honored and humbled to have uh, Jason Maravich on with us today, um, the son of iconic player Pistol Pete Maravich. Wonderful stories we're sharing here today. But I remember watching that video of when the top 50 players were, were named. You and your brother were standing there side by side. You both had the jacket on. You could see the number seven there on, on your right sleeve. How did that feel? Because again, your father was the only one who had passed at that time. But how did it feel for both you and your brother to have on those jackets representing the name and just having all of those players around you? What did that mean to you? It was surreal. I, I, I don't think that whole weekend, I didn't think it hit me until the whole thing was over. Uh, I remember when we were standing on the podium, we were standing next to George Gervin, and he was cracking jokes to try to keep us Ice loose. man. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I mean, I'm, I, he was, he helped us a lot. Cause I, I remember I was, I was petrified trying to, you know, keep my cool and trying to, I was nervous <laughs> and I was a very shy kid. So, you know, being in front of 20,000 people with these other all time great players, just, I was just felt out of place. So <laughs> um, were, were, were you shaking? Were you trembling? And what was the conversation between you and your brother at that time? Cause I'm sure you guys are looking around like deer and headlights, like, Oh my gosh, this is really happening. <laughs> no, nah, we were, we just, you know, before we went out there, uh, my brother tapped me and he goes, are you nervous? I said, yeah, of course I am. <laughs> um, so we didn't, uh, we just tried to stay quiet and we were just looking at all the guys coming out and we were just, I mean, these are the guys we grew up with and guys that played with my dad before my dad. I mean, this was the whole history of the game in one setting and nothing had ever been done like this. So, you know, I'm walking, I'm walking shoulder to shoulder with Bill Russell, George Gervin, Michael Jordan, David Robinson, uh, Larry Bird. Like it just, I mean, I couldn't have asked for a better weekend because I was like a basketball nut. I used to watch every game on TV. I knew every player, like in the 80s and 90s, I could tell you every player, even on the, the bench, I followed it religiously. Like it, it was a big part of my life. So uh, I couldn't, I couldn't have asked for a better weekend. I got, uh, <laughs> I got to hear stories about my dad. I got to hear stories about, you know, guys that were playing against each other like talking trash like if you played in my era you wouldn't do nothing like that kind of stuff like, <laughs> share, just, just, share some of those stories because i mean this this is what the viewers love to hear because you have a first hand of count you're sitting right there within earshot hearing these stories who were the players and what were some of those stories this is gold well i know uh carl malone and barkley were very competitive so they were talking trash uh John Stockton, you know, I know you're in Utah, uh, extremely nice guy, humble, quiet, just very reserved. Uh, he he was probably the most quiet guy there. Um, but like Bill Russell, you know, was 
him and Jordan were going at it. They uh, it was it was mostly like the old school guys. When I say old school, like the guys that were before eighties and nineties, like sixties, seventies. Yeah. You yeah. can trash to like the 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 newer guys that were at <laughs> you know at the time the current current players. Yeah. So it was all this. Well, you couldn't have played in my era, or if I played in your era, I'd do this or that. But uh, <laughs> it was all in it was all in fun. Like they, yep. you know, they they enjoyed it, and, it, and no one was taking it like too serious. But uh, I do remember that Shaq was not there, but uh, he got booed when they introduced him because a lot of people thought it was premature. Uh, he'd only played in the league for four or five years before that. It ended up make, being the right pick. He's an all time great player, but. A lot of people felt that wasn't right. And actually, Jerry West wasn't there either. Um, for I forgot what happened with Jerry, but everybody else was there. So I, I, I would probably say it's it's up there with the best weekends of my life, if not the best. Because wow. nothing like that will ever happen again. I know they just did the top 75, but yeah, yeah. The top 50, it, it, the first time they did it, it was just so unique. That's right. And the first time ever and to have everybody in yeah. one place and there you are, you know, with your brother, uh, you know, representing your father. And, uh, and it's and again, a shame. It's a shame, too, now, because they there's a lot of guys now that are deceased. Like when they did yeah. the top 75, a lot of guys have, have, have passed on. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and again, you know, we're talking about the stories and, and the trash talking and the ribbing. But again, that's all out of respect. I mean, these guys have such high regard for one another for what they did in the league with their careers, because no one laces them up for the first time saying, oh, I'm going to be a top 50 player. That's just a manifestation of all the hard work and hours and focus and dedication to the game. And, and there you are, you know, rubbing shoulders with all of them. Yeah, it was all definitely all respect. Like the guy, the guys that played in eighties and nineties realized that the guys came before them, they paved the way and without them they they wouldn't be doing what they're doing. So I actually think that's a bit of a problem with today's players. I don't think they show the proper respect to the guys that came before. Um, Great point. There's some entitlement there, don't yes, you there believe? Is. Yes, and I, uh, I think the guys before actually would pay homage to the guys that came before. I, I think you always have to. I mean, you know, guys like you know Elgin Baylor, who played a lot of guys, don't even remember who Elgin Baylor was, and he was a right. phenomenal player. I mean, that's right. I just think and, there's so many legends that get forgotten about because, for some reason, in basketball today, people act like basketball started in 2000. Yeah, that's they, true. They, that's true. You know, there's so many great players that played and you can't, you can't look at someone and take them out of their time. Like that. All you can do is look at their, that's why I'm like you. I don't like comparing errors or players. It's just a, like the, the basketball they play today is totally different from even 20 yeah. years ago. And, and the rule changes. Yes. So yeah, it, it's, that's why, you know, I, I see people on social media and I'm like, you know what, you, you can't even do that. So, you know, you to can't. say, Who's your Mount Rushmore? Okay, have a Mount Rushmore of the 60s, a Mount Rushmore of the 70s, yes. a Mount Rushmore of the 80s. Let's have some fairness and, and right. be open-minded to seeing the talent level and, and take into consideration rule changes, style of play, shot clock eras. <laughs> I mean, there's so many oh, things. It's, it's, I, had a, I had a discussion with my buddy. They were um, they said, who would ask me, who would I take between my dad and Steph Curry? I said, well, I'm taking my dad. And, uh, well, he said, why is that? I said, well, I said, just imagine if my dad had a three-point line and Steph Curry did not. I mean, it'd be a totally different scenario. You know, that's that – and no disrespect to Steph Curry. He's a great player. Right. I'm, I'm just yep. trying to say, like, when you when you start trying to compare guys from different eras, like you said, the rule changes and, and the way the game is played, it, you really – it's it's just so subjective. And, I mean, I know it's good water cooler talk, but, yeah. I, yeah. I, you know, I don't even like doing – the you know, everyone always wants to do the top ten or – yeah. Mount Rushmore, who's the goat, and all that. And I just yeah. think those conversations are silly because yeah. I, and you just you can't prove it. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Is. It's very subjective, and and right. and again, there's so many things to take into it, and that's why I'm enjoying this conversation with you because you get it. You've been around right. it. You've you've seen it, smelled it, touched it, and and I've been blessed to have coached at the NBA level and you know some of the top European leagues and and had won championships. So I too, again, that's why I pay homage to the pioneers who allowed me the freedoms to be able to have those opportunities yes. and and to earn the money doing what I love to do and to have a livelihood off of that. I mean, come on, we're we're the most blessed people in the world. Let's 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 change gears for just a second, Jason. 
I, I heard your dad in an interview one time and I loved hearing this and he was praising you because he said somebody said something to you and you were at a camp and I wanted to say it was in the 80s, you know, late 80s. And he's like, yeah, you, you, Jason, stepped right up to the free throw line and hit like 27 out of 30 free throws. And you're like, yeah, I can do it. <laughs> yeah, that was um, so I remember that very well. I got put on the spot. So what happened was my dad was up um, demonstrating and talking that he uh, to the campers that he had. It was, it was a good probably two to three hundred campers there. And I'm only eight, eight at the time. And uh, <laughs> my dad goes, like, I've taught my son all my drills. And I, well, somebody calls him out on it and says, I bet your son can't even shoot on a 10-foot goal free throws. And my dad looks at me and he goes, Jason, come here. So he puts me on the spot in front of, you know, 300 people. So I go to the free throw line. I hit 27 out of 30. And the kid was just like, you know, his jaw dropped. So uh, and my dad, my dad just gave, my dad just kind of stared at him and said, you know, uh, well, he, the kid couldn't say anything after that but uh and, and you're being so humble right now but to think of that pressure and to be called out and you're just like confidently yeah you can step up there and do it and then to hit 27 out 30 jason that's yeah, I, was, a, I mean that's, at that's the time I was, uh, yeah i mean i was my games in bitty basketball at the time i was playing on yeah. eight and a half a goal so yeah but uh he had me shooting on a 10 really early and uh so what happened was he would uh every day I would ask him to do drills with me for like an hour. So the upstairs in our house, we used to have a, a basketball goal welded into a beam, a wooden beam. And I had an eight and a half foot goal welded on one side and Josh had a five foot on in his side. So he would take us upstairs and do drills with us for like an hour a day. Um, <laughs> so that's where we developed a lot of our, you know, drills and work ethic and all that other stuff. So it was I, when when he called when he, when my dad told me to get up there and shoot the free throws, it I had done it so many times it, it was you know that's just all, another day in the office for you. <laughs> yeah, it's all muscle memory at that point. So that's right. Yeah, that repetition muscle memory is so true. I I love that, and I wanted you to have a chance to share that because when I, when I heard that on that interview, I'm like. I've got to bring that up to Jason and let yeah. him speak on it because 27 out of 30 as a small eight year old in front of yeah. a camp of people like just saying, Oh, you know, you can't do it. And you just step up and stroke it. That's impressive. <laughs> oh, that was uh, yeah. My dad, uh, you know, I'll never forget how proud he was after I got done just to smile on his face. Cause I was always trying to get his <laughs> approval. Just like my dad used to say, he was always trying to get press's approval. Right. And, yeah. Uh, so that was uh, one of my favorite moments with him for sure. Oh, wow. I love that. And then I read another piece and I believe you were being interviewed by the USA Today. And it was the first time your dad threw like a Nerf basketball to you. Right. Share that story with everybody, my man. So what happened with that was uh, Press did the same thing to him. So the first time Press had a nerf or a little bitty goal he threw the ball to my dad and he let my dad shoot one shot and my dad missed it and what press did was as soon as he missed it he wanted to shoot again press wouldn't let him shoot again so press made him go inside get behind the window and press started playing and he made my dad watch out the window and so what it did was it made my press was very smart and he was very psychological with his approach and it, when my dad saw, he was like, he wanted to go back out there and shoot because he, as soon as he missed, my grandpa was like, I got him hooked now. So he, he brought him in the house, let him look for about 20 minutes of him just playing. And then the next day, he'd let him shoot a couple more times. But what my dad did with me was he kind of did a little different approach, but I had a little Nerf goal and he threw it to me and I shot and I missed and I got frustrated. And, I, and this is like when I was three or four years old. And yeah. he's like, do you want to shoot again? I said, yes, I do. And he's like, okay. And he threw it back to me and I shot again and made it. And I, I was ecstatic that I made it. And he goes, well, that's enough for today. And I was like, no, 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 I want to keep shooting. And he, so he was a little more lenient with me than press was with him, but yeah, uh, I, it, that's, it's cool how it started both of us shooting on a, a little goal at three years old. And I love it. I mean, to me, that's the proverbial passing of the torch. Yes. Coach press Maravich to your father, Pete, who I think your dad was able to, you know, fulfill Press's dreams. And then here's your dad 
who deviated from that tactic a little bit because he learned that maybe he didn't want you to feel what he felt. So he manipulated a little bit and let you shoot. Right. And yet here you are, there's that past torch and the legend lives on my man. Oh yeah. Yeah. They, uh, he did an interview with Roy Firestone, um, not long before he passed away. And they asked him who he thought the best basketball player ever was. And I'll never forget his answer. It's, he goes, well, I don't want to say because my son, Jason hasn't, hasn't uh isn't that old enough to have played yet so he i always thought that was so cool like he you know he was really looking forward to me developing as a player and working with me and you know yeah obviously it didn't get to happen but um i always go back sometimes and watch that interview just kind of laughing uh, at it and i'm gonna tell you something i watched that same interview it's an up close classic with roy firestone roy's yes. been a guest on my show and so to have him interview your dad and i'm sitting there listening to that i'm like man it kind of gave me chills because i'm like i am so excited to have you come on and just share things from your perspective from your lens and what it was like and you know i i i feel bad that you were only eight years old when your father passed and i, I want to get into that too but jason to me these stories are, are amazing and I, and I can't thank you enough for sharing these Oh, no, I, you know, I enjoy talking about it. I, my dad brought a lot of joy to a lot of people. And uh, I used to struggle talking about him because it was, you know, real close and personal. But yeah, as I've gotten older, I've gotten more comfortable in my own skin. And, you know, I don't mind sharing stories about him because I know people want to hear about him, which yeah. I understand. So you bet. Well, and, and let's I mean, we've we've still got, you know, 12 minutes or so. Let's talk about your mom, Jackie. Hmm? Uh, I mean, she kind of protected you guys from from the media for years and kind of kept you away from the spotlight and i think that was a, a maternal instinct to be protective and i think that's a wonderful thing what types of you know what types of conversations was your mom and dad having around the dinner table even though you're at a young age how do you remember their conversations and interactions because your dad went through this journey of trying to, you know, find himself and find peace, which later he found Christianity, which is wonderful. But what were stories around the dinner table like with you and your baby brother, you know, around the dinner table? The dinner, I mean, it was just a normal family conversation, but we did have dinner as a family every night, which was great, which, Love that. which nowadays really doesn't happen. Life is so right. fast paced. And, but uh, we would have dinner at the same time every day. And it was the typical, like, how was your day at school? you know, what, what, what went on? How are you doing? I mean, my, my mom and dad were very invested as parents and they, they, they taught us, you know, they were great parents. They taught us the right way to do things. I remember when we were little, before we went to sleep, my dad would play like a Bible tape to fall asleep to. And, uh, he was, he would make me memorize a Bible verse a day. Wow. So after he got saved, he did a complete 180 and, uh, it changed his life. And, he was all about helping people and trying to reach as many people as he could. And he did a great job with that. And uh, the dinner, the dinner conversations, just having dinner as a family is, is something I really miss. I mean, that was, yeah. you know, it's something simple, but it was, we, when you, when you had, when you had, you know, both parents and they were actually cared about how your day went or, you know, what was going on with your life. Like it, it meant a lot. Cause I know a lot of kids don't get that. So. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and, and I love hearing that because, it was about family and the family unit. Like you said, it was, you know, at the same time. And was that more of your father's decision or was that your mom's decision to be like, Hey, no, no, we're coming together. And this is what we're going to do. Cause your mom just seems so loving and nurturing and protective and, you know, just wanted the best for you guys and let you guys, you know, support you through your journeys. Yeah. My, I mean, I, there was one, one, one player, and I don't remember who it was. I think it was a guy that either played with my dad or played against him. And he actually said, he goes, uh, the best decision, uh, the best thing that ever happened to Pistol Pete was Jackie. And, you know, I, I agree with it 100%. Like, it, uh, my mom is absolutely phenomenal. I've, I've never met a woman like her. She is, I mean, after what happened with my dad, you know, it was just her and and me and Josh, and she had a lot to carry on her plate. And she she was tough and she did it as good as anybody could. So the dinner, the dinner convers the dinner thing was probably more of my an idea of my dad, strictly because my dad was very, 
disciplined and routined. And, uh, you know, he, he wanted to have a routine set in place. So what he, what he said went and, uh, he was, I'll never forget, uh, before he flew to California where he passed away, he was going to do a testimony with, uh, Dr. Dobson from focus on the family. And, uh, yeah, in Pasadena, California. Yes. He actually sat me down, looked me right in my eyes and said, if something happens to me, I need you to be the man in the house. That's wow. what he told me. Wow. So he ever told me. And then, and then he hugged me and then he was off the airport, you know, never saw him again. So uh-uh, Jason. that was, uh, yeah. And then oh. it's, just, it's just kind of ironic that he passed away on a basketball court, but. Right. Well, it, 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 it's like your dad could always foresee the future yeah. because he also said in an interview, I don't want to play 10 years and die at the age of 40. And that also happens. So for him to have the foresight again, to grab you, love you and hug you and embrace that moment to say, Hey, be the, be the man of the house. I mean, there's something prophetic about that. And to yes. think that you got to share that moment with him before he left to go do that radio interview. And then there he was finding the passion of the game back on the floor. And I believe is Dr. Dobson who said, he said, Hey, how you feeling? And he's like, I feel great because he was in a great space. You know, he was, you know, he, he found Christianity, he found God and, you know, for his last words to be, I feel great. And then basically he turned and then the way I hear the story is he collapsed and went down and, you know, of course they came and it's just hard to believe that God was finished with him at that time. But yet he was able to get out those last few years and to spend that time with your grandfather the last six months to drive him everywhere and kind of take care of him as he took care of him. I mean, they're just amazing stories of love and family and, and you know, selflessness, you know, in those actions. Yeah, my I always envied my uh, dad's relationship with press because I always wanted that with my dad. Oh, so uh, I remember uh, press died of bone cancer. I want to say nine months before my dad did. And yep. my mom and, and my dad were both in a room when he took his last breath. And before he died, um, my dad whispered something in his ear. And when my mom and dad were driving back home, uh, she said, uh, Pete, what did you whisper to press? And he looked at my mom and said uh, he told him he would see him really soon. Wow. And, uh, yeah. But he always had this, it, my, he had a, I, I, I don't want to say scary. He had a, he had a very um, real connection with the Lord. Like it. Yep. He, he, he always had this premonition that he was going to die early and um, no one ever knew that he had a heart defect. Right. One, and he had one coronary artery. One coronary artery and it was wrapped around his heart. So it had to work twice as hard to pump as much blood. And, uh, I've talked to doctors that have dealt with people that have had that same um, scenario. And they said, usually if it goes undetected, they don't live past 20. Right. And they said, right. But the amount of running my dad did, and they said it was a miracle he lived to be 40. Right. And they actually said that uh, the, the thing that blows my mind, all his numbers, we talk about no three point, no shot clock. The thing that no one likes to bring up or that doesn't know or forgets the most amazing thing to me is he played with basically half a heart. I mean, it's incredible. That's it really right. Is. That's right. Because you think about it, you think all that exercise and running and excruciating uh, it, physical exertion that strengthened his heart with that one artery to allow him to live and have the right. platform that he did for so long. So it's kind of a blessing in disguise, but yet undetected, unknown, because no signs, no symptoms. Your dad was a warrior. Uh, uh, beyond being so skilled and charismatic and, and the showmanship and the pressures that he ha had on himself and placed on him. Uh, I, it's just phenomenal to me to hear those stories. And, and I'm glad you touched on that. Yeah, it was, uh, he's, I think that's, you know, it, he probably, I used to struggle with this. There was a bitterness in me because of how young he died. I try to look at it more positively and, and the fact that I feel like God gave him extra time more than he probably should have, should have had. And uh, he, I think God used him and his platform for basketball and used, used his name to reach a lot of people. So I think in the last five years of his life, I think he lived, I think in 40 years, he lived as full of life as you, as you could possibly ask for. Yeah. I, and so, and I, I love, I love that you still maintain that faith and you still have that, uh, 
you, you know, that hope and you, you, you're faith based. And to me, that's that's a wonderful thing, Jason. You, OK, you've got to be a part of the Hall of Fame induction. You've got to be part of the top 50. But take us back to July 25th, 2022, when his statue was erected outside the center. Take us to that day and those feelings as you, your mom, your brother. And what was that day like to see the statue of your father? Well, my first thought was it was a long time coming. Like, I don't know what right? took so long. I mean, I had, I had people telling me like that statue should have been put up like 30 years ago. But that's right. Seeing that, seeing it finally, it was it was very sweet. Um, the the pose, which I absolutely love. I've never seen a statue. Most most poses on a statue are someone either shooting or dunking. Yeah. I thought we got to pick the pose. We all we thought the behind the back pass kind of encapsulated his game the most because you you never knew. The, the old joke was with my dad, like if he was looking at you, you never were going to get the ball. If you, <laughs> if you weren't, he, you better have your head on a swivel. If he wasn't looking at you. So we just thought like the unpredictability with the behind the back thing was the perfect pose for him. And uh, w w it was, a, it was a very nice night. It was well, well done. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, Dale Brown got up and spoke uh, a couple of other guys that had played with him. And there was a, a 10 minute video montage and the whole thing was just really well done. And uh, I've had, I've got friends that'll send me pics now and then if they're up there, they'll take a picture with the statue and stuff like that. So I love I it. It was it was one of my prouder moments for sure. Uh, and and I think it's wonderful that, that you know that they finally did get it done. I I feel the same way for Coach Jerry Sloan here at uh, the Delta Center mm -hmm. uh, here out with Utah Jazz because John Stockton and Carl Malone is there. But to me, I feel the same, and I'm putting out there that hopefully they'll have a statue for Coach Jerry Sloan, who I got to observe and consult with for two years. We'll have the same thing because I feel that the community and the the people and the fans deserve that honor because that that's who is the utah jazz just like your dad was the eye of the tiger and lsu basketball so to have that there I, i'm i'm thrilled for that and, and jason I, i'm loving these stories we got well, I about gonna, i was gonna tell you scott i uh I, my favorite team was the jazz growing up so okay I'm, I'm from so the late 80s jazz teams to the early to the late 90s that was my you know, I was a Jordan fan, but anytime he played the Jazz, I was I was I didn't want him to su succeed. So, you know, ever since the, the Frank Layden, uh, that's Carl my Malone, guy, Stockton, Mark, e <laughs> Mark Eaton, Thurl Bailey, those teams, all the way up to the Hornacek Stockton Finals teams. Like I, I've always been a huge Jazz fan. I thought Jerry Sloan was an unbelievable coach. Um, I liked his no nonsense approach. He was old school. So I think a statue of him is definitely deserving. I, I, um. And I think it would be good for Utah to have something like that because, you know, the Stockton Malone Sloan era was, I mean, I don't think you'll ever see that again. Let me tell you something. And I'm not just saying this because you're on my show. You come out here anytime, you and your brother and your mom have got a place to stay. We'll go downtown and we'll introduce you to Thurl Bailey. We'll introduce you to Coach Frank Layden. Uh, you know, those guys have been guests on my show. They are friends. And I would be honored to be able to have you shake hands with those guys. Well, I want to Just... tell you, Scott, too. I In my room, I have a couple memorabilia pieces. I, ha I have I have a shoe signed by Carl Malone and Mark Eaton. Oh. Uh, they were they were sized like 17, 16 or something like that. But it, it, uh, I got them when I was a little kid. So yeah, I got Mark Eaton's book right there over my Mark shoulder Eaton was the biggest human Ooh. being I've ever met, but also one of the nice, nicest guys I'd ever met too. Uh, well, let me ask you this for a last question. What is your favorite piece of memorabilia of your dad? His Bible. Oh, his, Ooh. I've, uh, I've had his Bible and it's got, ton it's, it, he's got so much writing in it. Oh. Like, like trying to decipher what all the scriptures meant. So that's that's the most personal thing to me. Now, the question I always get asked is, do I have the floppy socks <laughs> and from LSU? But we don't because what happened was he wore these gray floppy socks at LSU, but he was so superstitious about them that he wouldn't even let the, the manager wash them. So he would take them home. Well, what happened was they eventually just disintegrated. Yeah. So he did wear the big thick tube socks with the jazz and Hawks and stuff, but it wasn't the same floppy socks. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I love it. Uh, and I love the fact that he, you have his Bible with his handwritten notes right there. My, my friend, hold that close to your heart. 
keep that for your set. That is just a wonderful thing. And, and Jason, I can't thank you enough for, for be, taking your time and being selfless and sharing your stories with the, the thousands of, of followers and viewers. And I want to share this content so people can continue to allow the legacy to live on. And Jason, thank you so much, brother. No, thank you for having me on. I really enjoyed this. Oh, uh, this has been a blast. And hey, God bless you and your journey. Please, anytime, I I'm telling you right now, and I'm being okay. sincere, come out, spend some time here in Salt Lake City with me. We'll go travel around and uh, you'll probably see some old stomping grounds uh, of your father where, you know, oh. his footsteps were at. So come I on out. I love that stay. because uh, the last time I was in Utah, I was one years old. So <laughs> you got to do it. Yeah. Now, now <laughs> I'm giving you an excuse to get out here. You've okay. got a place to stay. My wife's a pretty good cook, so uh, we'll, we'll take good care of you. <laughs> All right, that sounds good. All right, my man. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this has been Jason Maravich, the son of Pistol Pete, and it has been an absolute honor to have these stories shared with you, the viewers, and, and Jason, uh, I'm, I'm glad that we got to build our relationship and I hope you take me up on it. Get yourself out here and uh, see where your uh, where, where your father's legacy continues to grow and his jersey hangs in, in the stadium as well. Absolutely. I appreciate it, Scott. All right. Well, hey, let's hope your brother uh, heals up real quick. You're my best to your mom. And uh, again, God bless you, my friend. Let's stay in touch, brother. We will. Absolutely. God bless you too, man. You got it. Ladies and gentlemen, again, Jason Maravich, the son of the pistol, Pete Maravich. God bless.